Living on the coast, climate change and acceptable risk. So I don't think you will have be too surprised to see that my presentation will take the part of three sections. First, we will look at living on the coast. And we will hopefully, by looking at the impacts of climate change and realizing what is acceptable risk, how we can make sense of how we manage the coastline and can ask the question, are we doing it properly? Ketchum, in 1972, in his book, The Water's Edge, highlighted human use of the coastal zone under six categories. Residency and recreation, industrial and commercial, conservation, agriculture, aquaculture and fishing, waste disposal, military and strategic. And these six uses are increasingly in competition with one another and in conflict with natural processes. If we go back a bit in history to 1911, there was a Royal Commission on Coast Erosion and Afforestation. Why? Because Coastal erosion was seen as the loss of land and therefore the loss of national wealth. Come forward to 1953, on the 31st of January, there was a storm surge, a storm which resulted on the east coast of Britain and London in 307 people losing their lives. A parliamentary committee then discussed what was to be done. And 30 years later, the Thames barrier was constructed. It's still not perfect. We have an additional uh, work done on the barrier because with sea level rise and the changes in the climate, we're having to adjust. But the lesson is that we will never let London be lost to the sea. And that is where we start to think. Centuries ago, the rich people lived on the hill the poor people lived close to the water. Developers have lately sold properties because everyone wants an interrupted sea view and they're willing to pay a lot of money for it. Therefore, it is the wealthy who are now living at the water's edge. So, as we go on with this activity of living on the coast and all our activities centered around coastal, activ coastal regions, we end up having many assets at risk. And climate change is considered as one of the most threatening acts of today's society that we have to respond to. But again, looking back in history, the period 1940 to 1975, there was a feeling that the temperatures were falling and we were heading to the next ice age. Within a generation, we had changed from the journals talking about the next ice age to global warming, global cooling to global warming. And at the turn of the 20th century, at the 21st century, we were sure that sea levels would continue to rise, storms would continue to become more frequent and more intense. That will change the way we manage and live on the shoreline. The debate at the turn of this century was, is it human driven or is it natural? Because the geological record shows that there were periods in the past when sea levels and temperatures were higher than today. From our perspective, it doesn't matter who is to blame for climate change, we have to deal with it. And this is, I could have chosen many places around the world. This is uh, my PhD student, Bronwyn Palmer, uh, 2007 storm in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. What she was tasked with as leading a team to respond to storm events and make sure these are addressed in future. So for example, assessing the vulnerability. And the vulnerability was, can be seen with these storms and the activity. And if we remember 2014, Dawlish Railway 
being washed away, how much activity to get that railway line reinstated virtually straight away because of the damage to the economy. So, we have climate change as a problem. If we start to look, continuing on, early 2000s, in 2001, how do we predict what will happen? We use computer models. What do these computer models tell us? Well, a very influential American meteorologist, Christie, Christie says he looked at computer models with a degree of awe and sense of humor. And his rationale was, we can't find a computer model to to predict what's happening now, and yet we put in a lot of faith in what is happening 100 years from now. In, Matthews in 2003 wrote, well, this is very difficult because uh, there are a lot of uncertainties in all these predictions, while Nature Journal in 2002 had highlighted there is little comparative test for a check-in on these predicted heights and predicted storms. So, in the meantime, the early noughties, well, the computer power wasn't as high as today. So now we're having better computer models, more algorithms, better predictions. Or are we? If we start to look at the fifth IPCC report, these are the predictions of the sea level trends. If we look at the signal, we notice these wavy lines. These are projected, the trend lines are projected from linear regression and from uh, quadratic algorithms. Now, the important thing to look at here from our perspective is that between 2100, with a high, end, high emissions, Sea level is predicted to rise by between 58 and nine, uh, 52 and 98 centimetres. One metre sea level rise. And that's important because DEFRA have adopted one metre sea level rise by 2100 for managing the coastal areas and assessing risk. I don't think it will reach that, however. And the reason I don't, I've done a lot of work on sea level rise. And in the first 15 years, found that Seven Estuary, Bristol Channel, was about 2.4 millimetres a year. Now, it will accelerate or rise slightly. Now, friends or colleagues I've worked with in the Azores, so Ponta Delgada data sets and also Newport, Rhode Island, have shown a similar sort of rise. So, these rises of 2.4 would have to be accelerated significantly to reach that one meter level by 2100. I've also looked at the sea levels and done further analysis and found extreme sea levels were correlated to the North Atlantic Oscillation. Now this oscillation, the weather pattern, Icelandic lows and highs against the Zorian highs and lows, and they determine the western winds, the speed of the western winds, and also the height of the storms. Now, if that is the case, we see that the extreme sea levels records are showing a downward trend in the extreme levels, but when the storms do happen, they're far stronger. So my work has shown that the storms are getting less frequent, but when they happen, they're far stronger and have far more impact. And recently, the journals have actually indicated that uh, other researchers are finding similar uh, results in other parts of the world. If we start to think about sea level trends, a colleague of mine in Australia nearly lost his job. He published in 2010 sea level research in the Journal of Coastal Research, which was picked up on by the media and by television. At that time, we had, <laughs> he had a lot of grief because he was telling the 
world that the ways the Australians were looking at sea level was wrong. It was even debated in the Australian Parliament. However, luckily, he kept his job, and in 2018, two weeks ago, at the Coast, International Coastal Symposium, he made a keynote speech in which he identified that the linear trends and quadratic ways we identify sea level rise are not robust enough. And the reason is, if we look at the complete time series, there are seasonal influence in the sea levels, there's a nodal tide, there's a pole tide, and for example, we have the North Atlantic Oscillation, they have the Southern Oscillation, there's random white noise, and the complete time series incorporates all this. You need special mathematical techniques, he was arguing, to break down all the individual components. So, how do we manage the shoreline? Because we are now looking at the UK, England and Wales, one metre sea level rise, which I don't think will happen by 2100, but that is what DEFRA have adopted. Now, we in England and Wales adopt shoreline management plans for our risk management and assessment of climate change, sea level rise, storms, flooding, and socioeconomic consequences. That being said, if we have to manage the coastline, there are four options. And we do this now in the second generation plans by epochs, 25, 50, and 100 years. So we're looking at 2025, 2050, 2100. And what we might do may be different over those epochs. So, for example, what we can do on the four options, advance the line, i.e. we push the sea away, like the Dutch have done. Hold the line, which we generally tend to do. We build seawalls, we beach nourish, to hold the maintain the position on the shoreline. The two others, managed retreat, no active intervention, are controversial. Managed retreat is, well, over a period of time, we will leave the shoreline, relocate further inland, and lose the assets. Or no active intervention, we may have defended in the past, but no longer. So I, as an academic, and many managers have used these methods in the past to manage the shoreline. You academics, it's all right, you can just, you don't have to do anything, just sit in your office and write. <laughs> That's engineers telling me. Anyway, the option managed retreat came back to haunt because we have not looked, how do we implement managed retreat? Once we make the decision, what happens? And it was brought to my attention in, <laughs> in February 2014, the BBC phoned me and asked me, would I come and take part in a programme week in, week out at Fairbourne on the North Wales coast? They said, do you know anything about uh, shoreline management plans? I said, a little. So I <laughs> we, <laughs> so we went up there and, uh, yes. So they said, do you know, why have you told these people they've got to leave the Hordens? Well, it you know, we just, it's Gwyneth County Council had adopted the managed retreat strategy for Fairbourne, which you can see there, approximately 400 homes. It went out on the 11th of February, Tuesday, the 11th of February, imprinted on my memory, this. <laughs> and immediately that day, the devastating effect on the community. Their properties value through the floor, they couldn't get insurance, they couldn't get mortgage, they couldn't sell their properties. Luckily, in some ways, the Welsh Government hadn't adopted, endorsed the adoption. So there is a fair ball moving forward. My problem is that how do we manage with people? Uh, if we're going to get them managed retreat by 2025, do we move 400 houses out on block? And then do we have to demolish those houses to stop people coming in and resettling or squatting? Who's going to pay? Where are the people going to go? 
these hadn't been thought through. That three profiles were the decision of managed retreat. <laughs> One on a rock. And if we look, there's a railway line behind. I'm sure that even though the Cambrian Railway may be uh, going back, um, being relocated, if it was threatened, we'd defend. So a managed retreat land position will change at some stage to hold the line. My view is, whilst having a large area strategic plan for managed retreat, when you find an area and threat, what we should do, and this is my main point, we should do detailed studies over a long period of time, a minimum of five years. We need to collect beach levels, we need to analyse these alongside water levels, alongside wind wave data. We need to understand how that coastline behaves. We then need to do vulnerability assessments on the shoreline, which can be done to see which areas are truly vulnerable and where we can improve resilience. It'll cost money. Nobody wants to spend money. But the costs of doing the testing and doing the monitoring will save far more than this situation where you have 400 people losing their homes, potentially. Not very. So, I leave you with my going home message. Decisions for managing the shoreline, such as managed retreat, and no active intervention must, and I don't uh, say should, must be based on detailed analysis of the threatened coastline over a suitable period of time. To me, that sounds simple and obvious. But it was not done, and the consequences for those poor people in Fairbourne, they're still living with it. Anyway, thank you very much for listening.